Hello and welcome back. I love this quote from Zoolander. What is this? A center for ants? How can we be expected to teach children to learn how to read if they can't even fit inside the building? The center has to be at least three times bigger than this. He's absolutely right. Thank you. I have a vision. Because it's not only true, I mean, it does actually need to be at least three times bigger than that. But it's also not too far from how mathematicians actually work with inequalities, where the actual estimates that we end up getting are grossly larger than the actual quantity. So for instance, if you take a look at these six numbers in the complex unit disk, here. So if we want to figure out what they add up to, we just take the arrows, put them end to end, and this is what we get. It's a very small quantity given these six different vectors. But if we want to use the triangle inequality, and there's no analyst that doesn't use the triangle inequality at least six times in a day, then what you end up finding is that you align all these vectors and you stack them up, and that is your upper bound on this very, very small quantity. And it is such a huge gap between the actual value and the upper bound itself. And so mathematical analysts do this for a living, and our estimates are so terrible, but they actually end up working most of the time. And so often we have a sequence that we're trying to show goes to zero. And what we do is we upper bound it by something really huge that is also going to zero. And so they say that if you are a mathematical analyst, which I am, then a mathematical analyst spends his days looking through literature for inequalities. And literature like this. This is Hardy, Littlewood, and Polya's book, and this was published in 1964. This book has a ton of gems to look through here, including the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, the Holder inequality, also the Young inequality, and several others. And so today I want to talk to you about six different inequalities that have come up in my own research, and let's go ahead and get started. It's a walk-off. <laughs> So why don't we start with this one, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. It's essentially a theorem about inner products. So if you have, say, a vector in R3 and say X and maybe another one Y, and you take their dot products, so you get X1, Y1 plus X2, Y2 plus X3, Y3, you can get an upper bound on the absolute value of that if you take a look at the magnitude of the two individual vectors and you multiply them. And so you can extend this to, say, infinite series. In general, this is the fundamental inequality for all of Hilbert space theory, where in Hilbert space theory, you talk about inner products rather than dot products. And you can have inner products represented through integrals. So for instance, if I have the integral of f times g, say, dx, I can get a bound on the absolute value of this integral by taking a look at, say, the L2 norms of F and G. And this comes up all the time in reproduced kernel Hilbert spaces. So for instance, if you watched the Doctor Strange video, you would have seen that we demonstrated that the Hardy space functions all have a radius convergence of one, because you can use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality on the actual series and show that that's actually a bounded quantity. And so it is actually absolutely convergent as long as your absolute value of Z is less than one. But there's other inequalities are closely related, and so this is the Holder inequality. It looks slightly different, but not too different. So the Holder inequality, it starts the same way as the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So keep in mind, you do need that 1 over p plus 1 over q is equal to 1, but you get pretty much the same thing as what you got for Cauchy-Schwarz. So you take a look at the sum of, say, xn times yn, and this could be an infinite series. Take the absolute value of this, and it can be bounded by the pth root of the sum of xn to the p times the qth root of the sum of yn raised to the q, and absolute values on the inside of those sums. And that's a Holder inequality, and this directly transports over into the integral case. And in general, people talk about a lot of these Banach spaces that come from LP spaces, and this is where you're going to be using the Holder inequality the most. And in a future video, I actually want to talk a, a bit about Banach spaces that comes up in my research, and that would be corresponding to a lot of these Fox spaces. So the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and the Holder inequality, they both more or less do the same thing, but you are talking about, say, sums of squares versus sums of pth powers of things. And so that's one really nice category of inequalities, but there's definitely a lot more. So now let's talk about Young's inequality. I really like this one. 
there must be an on button somewhere. Press the Apple thing. Now let's talk about Young's inequality. When you think about Cauchy Schwartz and the Holder inequality, something that they do is they sort of maintain the same sort of power in all the coefficients. So even though you go from x times y, you think of that as sort of a quadratic term, and then on the other side, the inequality for, say, Cauchy Schwartz, the x's get squared, but then they're ultimately square rooted after the sum. So that doesn't get to be any more than, say, quadratic on the right. But Young's inequality is a little bit different. So you start with a product on the left, and so say x times y. You take x times y and you bound that with x to the p over p plus y to the q over q, where p and q satisfy the same relation we had for the Holder's inequality. And in this sense, it's interesting because you're changing, exchanging a product for a sum, and that sum doesn't have to necessarily be quadratic like what you had on the other side. And so the inequalities that you get out of Young's inequality end up being a little bit different in character than, say, Cauchy, Schwartz, or Holder's in, in that way. Now, I've seen Young's inequality used specifically in this form in, say, Lyapunov analysis and trying to get stability theorems for nonlinear control systems. And you can find a lot of that sort of work in, say, uh, my mentor Warren Dixon's book on nonlinear control theory with Lyapunov techniques. I forget the exact name of the book, but I'll put it here. But there's a generalization of Young's inequality that I think is totally cool. And so if you take a strictly increasing function f, and so it is an invertible function, and you take a look at, say, the product of, say, x times y, then you can get the upper bound on this, and this is one of Young's inequalities, as the integral from 0 to x of f of t dt plus the integral from 0 to y of f inverse of t dt. And this actually ends up giving you an upper bound on the other side. And if you choose, say, f of x to be, uh, I think it is x to the p plus 1, then you get the original Young inequality. So if you want to prove the first version of Young's inequality, well, you can use Jensen's inequality. And so why don't we go ahead and talk about that next. So Jensen's inequality involves convex functions, say some phi. And the idea is that if you take phi and you throw inside of phi, say an integral, then you can move inside of that integral to get a bound on the original function. So that means that the integrand is actually being placed inside of the same convex function, and then you're integrating on the outside. And so there's a lot of good examples where you can get good use out of this. So for instance, if you want a convex function, well, x to the p is a convex function, provided that p is bigger than one. And so if you have, say, an integral raised to the pth power, and that happens more often than you'd think, you can actually move that inside. That's Jensen's inequality. Now, Jensen's inequality was employed by a colleague of mine, or a co-author of mine, on a paper that we wrote. So I had developed this mid-tag Leffler space that had, was parameterized by his Q. So he showed that uh, the methods that he was using, uh, he got a bound for the certain quantity. When he sent this to me, he told me that he wanted me to see if I can get this to work. And that's where I used this inequality the hausdorff young inequality. Now, for the hausdorff young inequality, we're back to the Holder relationship between 1 over p plus 1 over q is equal to 1. And I love the symmetry here. So if you take a function f over rn, and you take its Fourier transform, you have this nice inequality between them, where if you take the integral of the absolute value of the Fourier transform raised to the qth power, and then you take the qth root of that integral, then that can be bounded by this as long as p is between 1 and 2. And so I think this is a really cool relationship between the Fourier transform and the original function. The Jensen inequality and the hausdorff young inequality both came up in a little bit of work I did with the mittag leffler space, and there was one lemma that we made that is for complex analysis. And so there's this theme with a lot of complex analysis that comes through, and it's basically that if you have an entire function, there's so much structure there that if you try to impose any sort of restrictions on it, that immediately you cramp down on the expressiveness of the resultant analytic function, or entire function. So classically, we have this theorem by Liouville, which basically says that if you have a bounded entire function, then it must be constant. And so this theorem that we came up with sort of goes with the same theme, except our upper bound is a little bit more complicated. So the bound ends up being the magnitude of some psi of z squared 
where psi is some entire function. Don't worry about it, it's not really that important for this. Then we have this multiplied by e to the magnitude of phi of z raised to the 2 over alpha for some alpha between 0 and 2 minus the magnitude of z raised to the 2 over alpha. And if this ends up being a bounded quantity, then phi must be affine or a linear function. Now the way we get at this is that we try to access something like the Fourier coefficients of phi. And what's really cool is that if you end up taking some entire function and you take a look at its values around the unit circle, if you take those values and you unpack them and you try to find, say, the discrete Fourier series that comes from this, what ends up happening is that these Fourier coefficients correspond precisely with the Taylor coefficients you get when you do a Taylor expansion around the origin. So that allows us to use this bound that you get on the Fourier transform of your function to make statements about the power series of an analytic function. And so then, since we have this identification between the Fourier coefficients of an entire function and the Taylor coefficients of an entire function, we see that if we put in, say, r times z inside of our entire function, then the Fourier coefficients will change by multiples of r as well. And so it's exactly this idea that we end up using. And we had to use Jensen's inequality for alpha in one interval and the house of young inequality for alpha in the other interval. And so let me show you exactly how that ends up boiling down. So here's our objective in the proof. We ultimately want to get an upper bound on a power series with non-negative coefficients. And these non-negative coefficients are going to be coming from our Fourier series that we just talked about. And since these are the Fourier series, that means that these are the absolute values of the coefficients of the original function phi. And now each of one of these coefficients are going to be attached to a power of r. And then as r goes to infinity, we're going to see that that ends up being unbounded. But we also have this other term that's going to end up coming here, and this comes from the magnitude of z. And so this is going to be subtracted by some power of r. And ultimately, the idea is that if this whole quantity, this term that's blowing up to infinity and this minus r term are going to be competing with each other to get a bounded term on the other side, that means that most of the coefficients out of that power series must be zero, with the exception of maybe the constant and maybe the linear term. And so that's what we're trying to set up here. And so we start off with this inequality and we're going to take this quantity, we're going to assume that psi is non-zero at the origin, just keep things simple here, and now we're going to take the logarithm of both sides. And so now what I want to do is I want to get rid of this psi. And so what we're going to use is we're going to use what is called the subharmonic property of the logarithm of an analytic function, which means that if we take an integral from negative pi to pi in a circle, that ends up being bounded below by the evaluation at zero. On the other hand, we're still integrating all these other guys. So what we end up getting here is that now we've eliminated that psi term and that magnitude of z term that comes out nice and clean. But now we're left with the integral with this magnitude of phi r to the e to the i theta raised to the 2 over alpha. And now this is where we end up diverging. So if alpha is between 0 and 1, then we're going to use Jensen's inequality to get where we want. And if it's between 1 and 2, then we have to use a hausdorff young inequality. So why don't we go ahead and take a look at that inequality in this case. So in this case, what we see is that in order to use the hausdorff young inequality, our p-value is going to be 2 over alpha. And that ends up making our q-value 2 over 2 minus alpha. And so Interestingly here, we can end up using the hausdorff young inequality to change that integral and we can get a lower bound again, so getting smaller and maintaining that upper bound that we have on the other side. Now we're going to end up having this power series here, and so now we can come to the same conclusion we did before, that it, since this term is going to be blowing up, the only way that, that we can kill it using the term r raised to the 2 over alpha is if the, only the first two coefficients of our power series were non-zero. And so there you go. That ends up using the Hauser Young inequality. And now we have demonstrated a new little theorem about complex analysis. And it says that if we have a phi that is entire that satisfies this bound, then we end up having an affine function. And so that ended up being very handy for us and actually proved one direction of the theorem that we needed. And so if you're interested in more of that, then, you know, check out my paper. 
and eventually we'll get back to talking about complex analysis and all these other things on my channel, but there's a lot of math to cover. So those are five inequalities that I use a lot and I think they're extremely important. And so mathematics, as we know, is a beautiful subject. And is there really anything more to math than being really ridiculously good looking? There it is. Until I see you next time, have a great day.